What's going on, Creation Grounds? I'm your host, Aaron Lloyd, and this is episode 62 of the Creation Grounds. Before I get into our next marvelous, fantastic, intelligent guest, I want to encourage you to like, share, subscribe, tell people about the podcast. They'll be interested, will be inspired, educated, and all of that. Our next guest is Zoe Malik, and Zoe Malik is a news producer on Full Frontal with Samantha B. She's an NYU graduate background in science and research and it's fascinating what she does and she goes into it in this episode but she basically is a fact checker for the things that happen on these shows and has a lot of she's i call her a walking encyclopedia because she has so much knowledge in this episode she talks about how to distinguish accurate research versus inaccurate research and what you can do to find facts for yourself She gives a glimmer of hope for humanity towards the end. She talks about futurism a little bit and AI and things like that. Um, I saw T2, so I told her I was kind of nervous about all that that's going on, but obviously you can't stop time and and humanity's progression. So we kind of had a a conversation about that. Um, We talk about a typical day in in the life of a news producer and writer and how segments are coming to being what you what the viewer sees and just much much she gives brilliant advice for creatives in general about facing no's and and um, really enjoying the process rather than the destination which I 100% agree with you're gonna enjoy this episode you're gonna love Zoe Malik enjoy this episode with her coming at you now Welcome to another episode of the Creation Grounds. I have the lovely Zoe Malik on with me. What's up, Zoe? Hi, what's up? Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. So I'm curious. You're the first person on this podcast that does what you do. And I'm fascinated by what you do because I didn't know it existed prior to meeting you. So what what is it that you do exactly? So I am the news producer on Full Frontal with Samantha B. And what that basically means is that I research the topics that we talk about on the show and I create a research packet for the writers to read through, um, which is sort of a condensed version of the topic and issues within the topic. And I go ahead and learn everything about whatever it is that we're talking about, whatever was pitched, and so that I can answer any questions that they have, and also to help build the narrative arc of what it is that we want to say, whether it's something like environmental racism or climate change or our sewer system, or whether it's about the vaccine, about the pandemic, whatever the topic might be, we I sort of learn everything I possibly can about it, read as many articles, reporting, books that I can get my hands on um, to have as clear a view about what's happening so that when we're telling everybody on the show what's happening, it's clear and concise and is factual and true, especially in a, in a time when you know, think facts are important in a very different kind of way. We want to make sure everything we're seeing is completely backed up with data, facts, research, studies, things like that. So it sounds like you are the backbone of the show. Without you, there is no show. You know what I mean? (laughs) You could say that. I don't know if I would say that. Um, I work with two other fantastic people um, and the three of us sort of, you know, take turns creating packets. And we also do something called a line check. So a line check is basically we go through the script. So once they read the research packet and they create a script and they put jokes in it and make it so it's relatable and funny and assuming that the general idea is correct there, we then go in and literally line by line check the script to make sure that everything is correct. And we're very particular about stuff like this. So we had you know had like if she says you know this is a very rainy town i'll go up and look at the rain statistics to make sure that it is in wow. fact more rainy than other towns or like we make sure that everything is as correct as possible and another example would be like if if she said most you know people blank 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 and we're like oh can we switch from most to many because it's not more than 50 percent it's like you know 42 percent so that's not the majority so can we say many so it's it's very like in the weeds and and just making sure that every single word that we're seeing is correct and it's very like sort of parsing out minutia um, which you want to be able to do without also killing the comedy because sometimes the fact will step on a joke and so then you have to sort of negotiate as to, is this clearly a joke? Um, does is it come off misleading? Things like that. So it's it's 
it's sort of working with an art, art form of comedy. That's wild. Super detailed. What, what drew you initially to research? So um, I actually started out my career as a research, as a research coordinator at NYU. Um, I, was, uh, I worked in the population health department at NYU Langone, and I ran studies on smoking cessation, mental health, oral microbiome, and I wrote a few papers um, that were published in science journals, and I worked with a couple of amazing um, PIs, and I trained a, a team, and, and we sort of, I was a researcher, a science researcher, and um, then I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, and I just like quit that whole career and I was lucky enough to get a position at NPR's Latino USA where I started as the assistant and I sort of kept asking if I could do more. So I would, I would do everything to be an executive assistant and I kept asking if I could like do more and because, you know, it didn't have a lot of money, they're always happy for free work. So, I, you, know, at, you know, by the end of it, I, I was, I was part of the field reporting team that was part of a podcast that they recently released called Suave. I was their researcher for a while and fact checker and sort of learning on the job. Um, and that was my point for being there. Like I wasn't getting paid for any of it, but I was just trying to learn as much as possible and doing science research and doing journalism research aren't that far apart. They weren't that, you know, I had skills that I could apply to this other thing that I wanted to do. And that's what I tried to do. And then my next door, I got very, very lucky. My next door neighbor worked for Samantha B. And she told me over dinner one day they were looking for a fact checker. And I said, please let me apply for that. I would, I would be, I would really like to do that. And she said, sure. So they hired me as a fact checker. Then I became the researcher, then I became senior researcher, and now I'm the news producer for the show. That's awesome. It's a blessed journey. It's yeah, incredible. It's very lucky. I mean, it's, it's a lot of, I mean, I work really hard, but a lot of it is luck. A lot of it is just blind luck, which is why when people ask, how do you get ahead? I'm like, well, you got to be lucky. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> there's work a lot hard. of people who have a lot of talent and work really hard. Um, but I mean, I, I feel very blessed to to, to have, you know, had that next door neighbor. I don't know how else I would have gotten into this sort of position because it's not the, some, the kind of thing that they do an open call for. It's just not, that's just not how it works. So networking, getting to know people, like that's that that's how you do it. But I, I, I wasn't even very good at that. I just had a name for her <laughs> who I had over for dinner one day. Um, and that was very, very fortunate of me. That's awesome. And for you, what's the favorite thing that you like to research? You've got to have a topic or something that you really like. What do you what are you passionate about researching? Um, well, I'm very because of my science background, when it comes to stuff that's um, science related, I really um, love that. And I also love anything that we do on futurism in science and sort of be projecting forward of where technology is going, the good and the bad. Um, and that's the stuff that's most fascinating for me, not to, but honestly, almost everything that we, that I get to research, I really enjoy because it means I learned something and I love to learn new things. And this, like, this job fits in very well with my personality of being like, uh, insufferable know-it-all and like, just, you can be like, well, actually it's 23.4, not 23.6. <laughs> and so yeah, I just love to learn things, but I love the stuff about um, futurism and sort of like where, what the future of humanity looks like, good or bad, where technology fits into that, where artificial intelligence fits into that, and sort of what we're capable of as a species. Because the, the thing about humanity that is so interesting is that our bodies are actually very fragile they're very mm -hmm. very you know climate change like the planet's going to be here long before long after the human species is gone because we need a certain temperature we need a certain this but the fact that we've created things like computers and internet and all of that are the thing that makes us so unique is our ability to build on prior knowledge um, and to do it over and over again, like the intelligence that we have of like tool building, um, because like a programmer can't tell you exactly how every part of the computer works, but they understand how to code and they're part of it. And sort of the fact that we can take pieces of knowledge that are built up over centuries and put it together to create spaceships and to create 
um, all these new technologies that come with their own set of problems is is really fascinating to me. Yeah, I saw T2 as a kid in the Terminator series and uh, <laughs> really freaked out. And then I saw a Netflix social dilemma the other day. So like all notifications off on on social. So that's that's a fascinating uh I'd be curious, what, what's your... it also creates problems that we don't anticipate. You know, Facebook's sort of become this monster that you don't anticipate and it's affecting the next generation of kids, right? Yeah. It's, the, it's that hit of dopamine from a notification. It's like, it's it's changing humans, right? The, the, the thing about humanity is we can adapt, right? And so now we're mm -hmm. adapting to this technology. We're getting addicted. Like it's creating problems we didn't anticipate because we're on the frontier of this. And that's interesting. Yeah. What are your thoughts? What are the good and bad of the futuristic like technology? There's good things about tech and there's certainly, but you have the research, you have facts. Yeah, um, so for you example, know. we did a, a, an episode about space trash, uh, which is something that is really fascinating. So like we have all these satellites that are basically junk that are left out into space once they're used for whatever it is that they're used for, right? And what's happening is that we're basically going towards an event where it's gonna create a chain reaction where one piece of trash is gonna hit another piece of trash is gonna hit another piece of trash. And we're gonna basically have tiny, tiny pieces of shrapnel moving at incredibly fast speeds around our planet. And this has already become a problem because little pieces are hitting things like the International Space Station. Like, um, like it's, it's becoming a problem, especially when you, if you want to you know, travel into space, um, mm -hmm. you have a barrier of very fast moving, tiny shrapnel that you can't catch. Um, and it's, it's sort of a problem that no one's really thinking of and no one's really taking responsibility for either, right? Because it's space. Who's in charge of space? Who's in charge right. of space? You know, who's responsible for that, right? There's no regulation. And, and that's true of a lot of new technologies because it's the, the laws are catching up much slower then the technology is evolving. So space trash is like one of those issues where if we get to this sort of, uh, they've come up with stuff where they're like, we can you know catch it with a net and they're like thinking of solutions. But if we get to that point where it, it'll become an exponential issue. So we haven't reached that threshold yet, but at some point it's gonna become like one turns, you know, it multiplies one turns into two turns into eight turns into 64 turns into you know and it's it's gonna go like that and you won't be able to stop it and like i said it's already been an issue for a lot of satellites for the iss and you know every time you send up a rocket there's like just pieces that are quite literally trash that you that you use up the fuel and you unload and there's satellites that are up there that are no longer serving the purpose they were sent up there for and so they're trash and and the problem is that some of them are so small you can't track them, but think of them as tiny, very fast bullets, faster than any bullet possible, right? Moving at the speed of orbit. Um, well, that you're sounds not fun. Be able to send anything <laughs> up there, yeah. So stuff like that. Those are problems that we didn't think of. Yeah, and you mentioned ISS. That's International Space Station, right? Just for <laughs> listeners, um, that sounds interesting. I'm not looking forward to going into space. Uh, so. You, you, you mentioned line checking as well, and you, you obviously are a writer, you have a, you have a talent for comedy, obviously, right? So, and you talk about this balance between facts not getting into the comedy. So what is that balance of finding the rhythm of that joke, and what's been your favorite segment to work on? So I, I want to be perfectly clear. I am not one of the comedy writers on our show. So I am the news producer. So as far as like the jokes, like we have a fantastic team of writers and they're the ones responsible for making it interesting enough for you to listen to. So even though I am a writer and I do write comedy, I do not do that for full frontal. So I want to give all credit to our fantastic writing team who's an amazing group of people. So I don't actually write the comedy for that show. Okay. Um, um, but I can answer the question as far as like balancing uh, comedy and facts, right? So basically we'll, this is, we'll back and forth. So within my little team, we'll decide what to escalate to the head writers, right? And so we'll always be like, is this jokey enough? Is this, is this like, is this clearly a joke? Is this like something where we have to um, correct it? And sometimes it'll be like, does the lo do we need to correct the logic of this joke? Because that doesn't quite work, you know? And it'll be, and sometimes it'll be like the joke is about a band from the eight and we'll say it's from, you know, the eighties band, blah, blah, blah. But the band actually started in the seventies and, and, 
you know, they, they separated in 82. So like it was an eighties band, but it was also a seventies band. Is that okay? Like a lot of it's just like ridiculous back and forth. And I, I want to make it clear. I understand that very few people are going to care except for the three, like the, my little, <laughs> team, you know, like no one's, no one's going to, I doubt anyone's, anyone's going to, you know, come after us because we got it to 72 for the band and not 82, you know, like, I realize, but it's important to us and it's important for us to be correct as much as we can be. Um, ultimately, whether or not the correct, once we decide amongst ourselves to escalate or not, it's the head writer's call, whether or not they want to change it or not. And they're the ones, they're, you know, the buck stops there, this buck stop at Sam and the head writers, and they decide whether or not something is worth preserving or not, because ultimately it's 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 her name on the show. It's their decision. I, as far as I'm concerned, my job is just to tell you what's wrong or what is not totally correct about this. And it's your decision whether or not to go for it or not. That's like an editorial choice. As long as you know, um, I'm fine with you making that decision because that's like above my pay grade my name's not on it you know I'm not the one as long as as long as I brought it to your attention that's enough for me there's some red line stuff that I absolutely will fight for and will not let people say on the air but like other stuff it's like so much so, so many shades of gray where I'm like if you don't think it's a big deal you think it's obvious it's like that's I'm totally fine with that yeah and in, in this in this like we mentioned the internet earlier there's so much information out there so as a researcher, how do you determine what's accurate research or what are actual facts versus inaccurate facts? Because so anybody can read anything on the internet. The best thing that you can do with any sentence, any fact, is try to go to the primary source. Primary sourcing is always the best, but that's not always the easiest to come by. Um, there's some, uh, you know, like the the Library of Congress, you know, if there's something usually, you know, you, you go and you find the primary sources of those things. I remember when I was doing research um, for a different show about anti-Asian violence, a lot of my sources were from the Library of Congress. And those were, you know, um, propaganda of that time, ads from that time. And those sort of have been archived through history and verified. Whether or not something is true or not, you can once you get used to it, you sort of get an idea about who to trust and who to not trust. But even so, um, they get it wrong, not intentionally, just because, you know, people are fallible. Um, so the best thing you can do is find the primary source. For example, it'll say that, you know, Senator so-and-so said this on this date. You can find the video of him saying that and check the date, you know, you can, you can find the actual um, fact that they're talking about. You know, you can look up the actual law and read what it says. You can, and I'm, and if there's something I don't understand that's above my, you know, that I've gotten pretty good over the years, but especially when I first started, if there was something I didn't understand, call up an expert, call up a law professor at, you know, Harvard or Yale or, you know, whatever university you can get a hold of and be like, what does this mean? And explain to me how. And it's what they do. They're more, usually more than happy to talk about their something that is their life's work and happy to explain it to someone else. That's incredible. And you have a background in science as um, NYU. So how do you think, as in your writer, so you're an artist as well, how do you think an artist that has a background in science views the world differently than just a, a artsy artist? <laughs> if if <laughs> any. <laughs> Well, I'm going to preface this with everyone use the world differently, whether you're an artsy artist or a sciencey artist or a sciencey science scientist, like everyone has a different perspective based on what you have. Um, I, I, I don't know, I can tell you how I view it. I don't want to speak for how an artsy artist, you know, how a different kind of person use it. The way I view it is that to me, I feel like a lot of people feel that knowledge is inaccessible and it's not. It's really not. Um, and I think that if I can do something by making, like, that's why I love our show. By making something funny, we make something more accessible than it was. So a lot of times it's not what you're talking about. How you're seeing it is so dry and unengaging, especially in a world now where everything is like a five second long TikTok or, you know, a quick image or a flash or a badge, like to keep per a person's attention is so difficult. Um, a lot of people 
you know, just read the headlines. And it's so hard to get people to understand the nuance because most things are not black and white. Almost everything is a shade of gray. Um, and I think that being able to, to let people access that through comedy or through entertainment is, is a, a real, you know, a real joy and a real, you know, and a, a responsibility. And it's something really cool to be able to be a part of because yeah, people, people think, think that, oh, that's something I couldn't possibly get, or that's something, you know, that's above my head, but nothing is, truly nothing is. You just got to take it in small steps and relate it in a way that is relatable. The problem is that a lot of scientists, because they're so deep into it, when they talk about these things, it sort of like goes above your head because they're using words that you're not used to, or, or, they're, or they're pontificating in a way that is a little roundabout or if you don't have the context you're not quite sure what they're saying um and i think that detangling that would be great for everybody because this is the first time in humanity where all of human knowledge is at your fingertips all of it i got a magic box in front of me i can ask it any <laughs> question about and, it, and it's got all the answers to all of human intelligence and history right there and the fact that we don't do more with that is is a shame. Yeah, you out here changing lives and IQs, making it accessible. I'm just gonna explain you a thing and try to make it not boring. Yeah. So tell me about a typical day as a news um, news writer, news producer on the show. What what is a typical day like? So we have two acts. We have the act two, which is something that has been planned out for several weeks. And then we have the act one, which is topical from that week. So for the act two, it comes from a pitch. It could be coming from me. It could be coming from another producer. It could be coming from literally anybody on staff. We'll take a good idea from anyone. Um, and once that pitch is made, it gets assigned out to research. And that's where me and my colleagues come in. And we create a research packet, which is basically me creating like a tiny book about the topic um, and you don't have to read the whole thing but I index it and I um, you know sort of make it as readable as possible I source it as much as we as we can and then it gets assigned the head writer goes through it he creates an outline I look at the outline make suggestions um, about like the overall arc of what it is that we want to say like I just did a piece on the sewage system that aired a, a couple of weeks ago and it's sort of like what did we want to say how did we want to relate it and we wanted to relate it to climate change and there's a lot of different ways a story can go um, you know and so it's sort of you want to decide what is important to you what do you want to focus on about this topic and what your take is sometimes that's clear in the pitch sometimes the pitch is more broad and you have to narrow it down because we only have like you know 12 minutes per act or so um, so it, it's it's good to have focus so once the outline is made by the head writer then it's assigned out to a writing team and they sort of take that information they take sections in the outline like one person one writer will take one section and they'll read that part of the research and they'll they'll be the ones who go in put in the jokes make it funny make it relatable make it readable um, then the head writer assembles it and once it's assembled um, then we have a call, then our uh, incredible fact checker, who's just this amazing person, he goes through it and he does sort of like, here's the red, the yellow and the green. And usually the person who researches fact checks him or cause like the researcher will have been living with this material for a few weeks and the fact checker, uh, and, you know, unless they researched it, will have a, like a fresh eyes on it. And you really, really want to try to have a second person always. Cause if the person who researched it is the person who fact checked it, the problem is that you will have a bias. You, you can't mm -hmm. help it because you'll have read it one way and no matter how many times you reread it, it'll be that one way cause that's how you read it. But if someone else reads it with a different perspective, then you need that. You need more than one pair of eyes on it. It shouldn't be one person. You should have at least two people in my opinion. Um, and so once we have the fact check, then we do a fact check call with the writers where they put in all of those edits. And then we stay on the call as they're rewriting the script so that anything that they say of that they change isn't incorrect. 
So like a joke that they put in, make sure that that makes sense, years that they want to say, and they'll be like, can we get a headline for this? Can we get a graphic for that? What do you, you know, can we say what, you know, what senators can we list for this? And we'll be on that call while they're rewriting and working on that. Um, and then we do it all again for act one, except much more quickly, because that we air on Wednesday, put together mm -hmm. a research packet and decide what the topic is on Monday. Tuesday, we do the fact check, it airs on, it airs and tapes on Wednesday. So the act two, we have, you know, several weeks and for the act one, because it's topical and we're trying to be like of the moment, it's the same process, just much, much faster. Yeah, it's a fast turnaround. Um, it's super fast. <laughs> Um, what, what advice do you have for aspiring writers or producers? I know you said you kind of fell into this, but from your place behind the curtain, um, if there is a producer or somebody who kind of wants to get into your, your line of work, what, what advice do you have for them? Particularly if they're a person of color as well. Um, I, that's a great question. I wish I had better advice than be lucky. Um, <laughs> I think that's the most helpful thing you could be. Um, but I also think that I think networking is important because there's the problem is with these kind of jobs, very rarely can just a normal person who's not in the know, who's not in the in industry, know about them. And that I think is the biggest problem with breaking in is that you need someone already in to break you in. And that's that's the worst part. I had a science background and you knew no one in the entertainment industry I knew I like I, I had no connections no nothing and I do know that networking helps and I would also give them the advice to to not if this is something that you really want to do like think about whether or not this is something you really want to do because you will have people tell you you can't a lot mm -hmm. um, I remember I went to this um this panel right when I was starting out and uh, I won't say who the person is but they were like the host of a news program and I told them that you know I've never worked in this industry I you know have no history but I'm very interested and this is definitely what I want to do and she was also a person of color and she basically said nah you have no chance you don't know anybody you're so much older than everyone and I was you know I'd already done a career so I'm like a lot older than other people in, you know, where I was when I started. And she was like, no, it's just not gonna happen for you. I'm so sorry. Like, it's just like, I just remember, and I remember leaving that meeting so angry. It was like one of those forums where they're like, you know, a panel of people and they let mm -hmm. the audience ask questions, that kind of thing. And I, was, I was so angry leaving that. And I was like, I will show you, there's no way. Like, <laughs> just make sure it's something that you want to do and make sure that it's something you enjoy because that way even if you don't get to where you're going you'll still enjoy the work and care about the work like if if it's something like you know love what you do you won't work a day in your life make sure that this is what you want to do you know get specific about what it is you want to do do you want to be in front of the camera do you want to, you know to be behind the camera do you want to write just comedy do you want to write informational comedy are you more interested in, in sitcom what's your ultimate goal do you want to be an ep do you want to be a showrunner think specifically about what it is you want to do and if you're um and there you know a lot of shows offer in internships and you know other ways to get in and uh, a lot of them have programs they don't always work out. They didn't for me, but um, keep trying. And it, but if I, you know, I mean, don't tell my bosses this, but if they didn't pay me, I would still want to do this. What I would want to do with my time, right? So as long as that's true, as long as it's something that you love to do, even if you end up not being successful, you get to do what you love to do for your job. And that's pretty great because because the fulfillment I don't know, some people I feel like, you know, feel like they'll be fulfilled when they're, when they win an Oscar or when they do this or when they do that. And I'm like, no, get, get fulfilled first. And then it'll mm -hmm. be easier to get that other stuff because it won't be the crux of, of who you are. Does that make sense? That's amazing okay. advice. I love that. Um, okay. You know, purpose driven and, and just like, yeah, the process, not, you know, 100%. That was great. Great stuff. What excites you most in your career right now? Um, right now, I'm really excited by um, 
the fact that I'm I'm trying different things and and expanding. So I'm I've been writing more. I've been lucky enough to be published by um, Star Trek.com. Uh, I had a piece in Scholastic. I had a piece in Salon, and they're all different things um, about different topics and like different varieties. So I really enjoy growing, and I really enjoy learning. Um, and so any point where I'm able to do that is great. So like anytime I'm doing something for the first time, that is something I've not done before is great because I'm learning a new skill. Um, always try to, to, you know, hone your craft more and more, you know, practice, try it in different ways, see what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy and, and try everything, try everything that you might be interested in so that you can be specific about what it is you want to do. Um, and I think, yeah, I think my, my fun part is that um, uh, I get to work with, you know, some great YouTube channels like the Try Guys. They've been just an incredible team of people who are just like, just fantastic. Um, and, you know, and getting to know editors and, and, and again, I don't know anyone in the biz. I, I don't, I, I don't have these network connections. So like when something of mine gets published, it's because I saw a tweet and they said they wanted free on sliders to write about this. So like, that's how I've been able to get published. Just like a straight up, hi, um, my name's Zoe. Uh, here's what I think, you know, here's a pitch for the thing that you said you wanted pitches for. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and sometimes they'll publish you right away and sometimes they won't. And and so you just gotta you just gotta try because there's no other way to do it. The only way to do it is to do it. One hundred percent. And I always say closed mouths don't get fed. So like you just putting yourself out there, you know? Don't don't be afraid of getting rejected. Just don't be afraid of that holds a lot of people back. Don't be afraid of people saying no, of people laughing in your face, of telling you you can't do it. Don't that's okay. That's okay. They don't know you. They don't know they don't know what you're about. They don't know uh, you know, how passionate you are. They don't know your talent because you don't know at this point either, right? Don't be afraid of getting a no because like a hundred no's is worth one yes. Just, you just need one. You just need one yes to get you started. And then one yes will turn into two and it'll turn into three and that's how it works. But you got to start with the no's. So don't be afraid of, of the no's. Don't be afraid of the no's. Who is your, when I ask all my guests this, when you think of the word creative, who comes to mind for you and why? Honestly, Tina Fey. Great. 30 Rock is great. Yeah, 30 Rock is great. Yeah, sure. Tina Fey is great because, first of all, her writing, like 30 Rock is a fantastic show, but what a lot of people in New York didn't realize is how niche it was, right? It was, hmm. it was really, really funny. And, and looking back, it definitely had some problems. I also want to acknowledge that there, there was, you know, of the time, looking back, there was some stuff that was not appropriate. And I want to acknowledge that. But in her time, especially, you know, first head writer at SNL, who was a woman, um, like she, I think, is someone who had raw talent, but also didn't care. Didn't care what, uh, you know, whether or not you thought she was good enough to do this thing. She was going to do it, you know? Um, I, I always think about this documentary um, I saw once about Seinfeld where he said that all he wanted to do was comedy and he figured out he had this tiny room that he rented with a, a single bed and he figured out how much it would cost him to rent this tiny room and to live on like bread and yogurt or like how much it would cost to feed himself and he figured out he could do comedy live in this teeny room and feed himself and therefore that was enough and because because it's what he loved doing that's what he did. And if wow. he if he had just stayed at that level, like, because that is all he wanted to do, even though he ended up being so successful, all he wanted to do was the thing that he loved. And I always think about that because there's people who do what they love their whole lives and they're never famous. You've never heard of them, but that's a great life. You got to do what you love for the whole thing. And with all, we're, we're kind of winding down. Um, uh, with all your knowledge, you're a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> um, what's... And this is, it's with all the, 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 you know, bad stuff in the world and stuff like that. What's your perspective? Is there hope for humanity? <laughs> like what, what's your perspective? What's the glimmer of hope, the silver linings amongst all the kind of chaotic things that are happening? I'm, I'm a pretty pessimistic. I, I like to think of it as a realist. Um, there's a, I think the hope would be that 
even with everything going on right now, this is still the best time to be alive. 100%. This is still in all of human history. Currently, this is even with everything going on, still the best time to be alive. There's no other time where you have this much convenience, this much comfort, this much food security, even though we, we're not at all where we should be, there are absolutely people homeless and starving, um, but it's been worse. It's been worse and overall it has been getting better. And so, I don't know, even if, even if this is the apocalypse, even if this is the end of all times, I would just appreciate I was here to see it, you know? Um, where- Sheesh. I'm just happy you know to see I, the end of the world. <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, think of it. We're the one of the few animals that has consciousness and that has the kind of intelligence to be aware of our own awareness. That is very rare. The fact yeah. that you are here, the fact that, you know, you were the fastest sperm ones, you know, the, that you exist, that alone is pretty, pretty incredible. And and I would, I would think about that from time to time, that, that the fact that you're here walking around thinking being who is aware of so much and is, has so much potential, that's incredible on its own. Like appreciate the little things, you know? And, and I feel like people get lost in the macro so much. They don't really think about the micro a lot, you know. You're 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 the first. You're the animal that rules this whole planet. You're part of that species. That's you know could have been an ant. This is uh, <laughs> you know that's pretty incredible. Just the fact that you're that you exist. How many things had to come together for that to happen? How many coincidences? How many you know? That's pretty incredible. I think that people need to, as far as the optimism, just just knowing that that's so rare is is where I you know sort of get my positivity. I, I am a very negative person though, so that's. Are that, you really? That. You don't, you don't read to me as a, as a negative person. I'm going to guess. <laughs> I'm like I, you know we'll all be fine. This is just a blip, you know. Even if I'm just saying, even if it's the apocalypse, hey, you were, you exist. That's pretty yeah. cool, you know. Zoe Malik dropping gems. I appreciate <laughs> your time, and this was a very fascinating episode for me. I hope you had a good time too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for for having me on. It was a, a real, real pleasure. Thank you for for taking the time. I really appreciate it.